Well, hello and welcome. I'm Tom Strong, President and CEO of Building Transformations and Principal at Wired Doc Construction. Thank you so much for joining us for the Building Transformations interview series. Uh, if this is the first time that you've watched this, uh, this interview series is really focused on in interviewing industry leaders that are focused on innovation and technology. Uh, we're focused on discussing uh, challenges in the industry, trends in the market, and uh, the obstacles that we need to over overcome as an industry to improve. And uh, today I had the privilege of talking to Keith Churchill, who is the Chief, uh, Chief Innovation Officer at Bechtel. Uh, Bechtel is a 124-year-old organization that does $20 billion in revenue with 55,000 employees. A real privilege to, uh, to talk to Keith. And with that, I'll just get into it. Okay, I'm here with Keith Churchill, who's the Chief Innovation Officer with Bechtel. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bechtel, Bechtel is one of the largest, if not the lar most largest, uh, general contractor, engineering, construction organization on planet Earth. I think you guys are doing something close to $20 billion in revenue per year and have something like 45,000 employees around the world. And Keith looks after innovation for this massive organization. Keith, thank you so much for joining us. Um, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I've done a couple of events with you guys and I, I'm really excited to be back and uh, just to talk a little bit more about something I'm really passionate about, which is uh, construction technology. So um, as you said, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for the Bechtel Corporation. Uh, if you don't know Bechtel, Bechtel um, is, uh, is a large scale EPC, Engineering Procurement and Construction firm. Uh, we are headquartered out of Reston, Virginia, which is right outside of Washington, DC. Uh, we do projects all over the world, uh, ranging in, in markets, including power, infrastructure, renewables, uh, energy, um, and, uh, and then we do work in defense and space, uh, environmental security, and nuclear. Um, we uh, currently have jobs on six of the seven continents, and um, you know, we have offices strewn about uh, the world in places like Australia, India, uh, the UK, um, U.S. and South America, um, and I, I'm 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 honored to work for a company like that that focuses so much on on innovation. You know, we've been around for 125 years. Um, we're getting ready to have our 125th anniversary here in uh, in the company, um, which started out in California doing real. Uh, we've we've done you know remarkable projects like the Hoover Dam, moving through uh, nuclear, the nuclear boom in the 70s into the LNG market, and now we're we're focusing on the future, uh, which is energy transition, renewable energy, and and helping to support uh, a net zero society. So uh, really happy to to be here and talk to you today. Awesome, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, what a cool job you have and what a massive company. Like, it's just hard for me to even wrap my head around the scale of the organization. Um, like, I, I guess one question I want to ask is how big are the projects? Like the average project size that you take on is, is it like a billion dollars and then you have like 45 or $50 billion jobs happening at any given time or like how big are these projects typically? Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's something that differentiates Bechtel from a lot of different companies is that our portfolio is not significantly large in terms of the number of projects that we do. Um, the size and scale and the complexity uh, of the jobs that we do is significant, though. So we may have, you know, like you said, 40 or 50 jobs in our portfolio at any given time, uh, ranging from about $500 million up to, you know, 12 or 13 billion, depending on the year and depending on the, on the market and, and some of the businesses that we do work in. Um, the complexity is really what drives the cost. You know, we're willing to go anywhere and do anything. Um, we're the ones you come to if you want the, the hardest job and the most uh, remote location done uh, where there may, may or may not be infrastructure or we might be in the midst of the most dense urban locations across the world doing a metro rail line. So uh, it's, a, it's a wide variety of projects, but uh, our expertise is, and, and our, 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 our main asset is our people and our expertise that we bring to the projects and our customers. When you think about those people, I think we said there were 45,000 people, um, maybe give us a, like a breakdown a little bit about who those people are. Are they mostly Americans or you're hiring people from all over planet Earth and deploying them all over planet Earth? 
Uh, yeah, that's one of the thing that you know. That's one of the things that that really differentiates Bechtel is is our diverse workforce, and we we strive for a a, a diverse and inclusive um, uh, company. We're we're really trying to improve how, how we approach that sort that aspect of 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 our world. Um, we do hire people from all over the globe, and and our our workforce is made up of of engineers, accountants. Um, uh, construction supervision, construction project controls. Um, we do a lot in the in the finance side of the business in terms of looking for ways to fund projects and helping get uh, project fi financial decisions across the line. So it's just a, a wide plethora, plethora of opportunities within the company. And you know, I like to tell people when they're looking at Bechtel as a, as an opportunity for for uh, for coming to work is that you know you may come in as a field engineer like I did and then end up as the chief innovation officer which you know my career path has been uh, a zigzag all the way to this point and and I think that anybody can come into the company and do anything that they want there's so many options so many different types of projects and so many um, different opportunities yeah, well, it's a really cool company and everyone that I've met at the, at the organization is is kind of knit from this really interesting uh, culture where you, you know, you, you guys are your, your family, your business, your people, you're moving to wherever that work is, no matter where it is on planet Earth, whether it's remote or not. And you got to be kind of willing to move from these giant jobs to giant jobs and like live uh, on that that project or with that project for a, a long period of time. It's a really interesting culture. I mean, it's if you look at like a small general contractor maybe operating in one province or state, it's they sort of think the same way, but it's they're restricted to that that region. Whereas Bechtel's region is planet Earth, and the projects aren't just you know some small school or hospital or whatever the case is. It's some mega project up and up, up in the wilderness. Really, just interesting work. Um, so what do you think, I mean, Bechtel is such a massive organization and it's obviously, you know, well-established 120 years, 125 years old. Um, what's allowed you to scale to the size you're at over this period of time? Is it, did you see a lot of growth uh, in the past 10, 15 years or has it just been kind of steady growth over that, that long history? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I would say that the thing, the single thing, you know, that that really differentiates us from a lot of our um, competitors is the fact that we're privately owned. Um, the Bechtel family owns, uh, you know, a significant portion of the business, and that allows us to be a little bit more uh, cautious as we as we look at different projects, as we take on um, different opportunities. We want to make sure that we're looking for. Um, the right partnership with customers and making sure that they align with the values that we're trying to bring to the table. I don't think that it's a secret that uh, Bechtel isn't always the lowest cost um, when you're when you're looking at, at projects overall. But um, you know our certainty of outcome, our ability to deliver for customers, our ability to build long-term relationships with customers and earn that earn their trust um, over a single project, which leads which leads to uh, multiple opportunities down the line, has really enhanced our ability to grow uh, and, and it's enhanced our ability to learn different technologies. I think that LNG is a really good example of, of how Bechtel has built relationships with clients, uh, delivered on those relationships and, um, and, and, and capitalized on that in terms of additional projects and additional opportunities that we are hoping to uh, really kick off here coming this year as, uh, as we begin to cycle back up. And to answer your question about you know, have we have we scaled significantly? I would say that the business is very cyclical, just like the construction industry. And and the fact that we're private gives us the ability to grow and shrink the business, um, depending on the demand of the of the uh, of, 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 of the industry at the time. Um, we are in multiple different markets, which enables our ability to uh, to sort of meet the demands of, of, of a downturn in one industry, like, in, you know, if energy was down, we would probably be up in mining, uh, which, you know, sub, you know, significantly, you know, subsequently hasn't been the case over the last couple of years. Uh, but our ability to adjust to the market, look at new markets, look at new opportunities and move into, uh, into uh, different places within the business has, has enabled us to, you know, weather the storm and then be ready to, to build quickly as we're hopefully going to see here in the next few years. Yeah, certainly, you know, as an organization, you're you're vertically integrated, you're, you're horizontally spreading out and you're in multiple sectors all at once. That gives you that you're agile and flexible and you're you're playing in the entire global market. So you couldn't be more well positioned really to maintain uh, maintain your size and continue to replace that backlog every year. 
Um, so you mentioned your, your career path a little bit. I mean, it's such an interesting position, you know, driving, being responsible for innovation. I'm sure it's it's more like how do you drive this this innovative culture across such a large large organization? But um, I really love to know a little bit more about your career path. You mentioned you started as a field engineer and then you've kind of worked in different roles uh, throughout your life there with Bechtel. I think you've been there for 14 years. Uh, how did you arrive uh, at this position and, and give us a sense of, of your mandate? Like, what is your responsibility? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and I, I tend to ask myself that same question about how I, how I ended up here. Um, I, like I said, I started as a, as a field engineer. I worked for an infrastructure company that did bridges and worked, moved over to Bechtel uh, early in my career. Um, worked on several projects in the energy business and um, got to got to see the the full breadth of the project from you know starting starting the project kicking off doing the uh, <clears throat> early works activities all the way through startup and completion which really gave me sort of a you know a, 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 a wide view of the entire project cycle and really helped me understand you know not just the dirt work part of it or the concrete part of it which was sort of my specialty but then really enhanced my ability to see the mechanical the electrical um startup and commissioning activities happen and and it uh it, it really helped me kind of frame my mindset moving forward i moved up into uh different project management roles including project field engineer on a couple of projects and then uh I, I was able to take a position in our corporate office in Houston as the operations manager for a corporate construction group, with, which really kind of opened my eyes to what Bechtel does as a business. It gave me the opportunity to see all of our business lines, our four business lines that we have now. We're hopefully going to add a fifth business um, business unit in the manufacturing and technology business. Um, and, and during that time, I got to build a lot of relationships, really understand what the company was doing, understand the company's priorities. And then at the end of the day, we started what we called the Future Fund, which was a $60 million internal fund that was really focused on developing ideas, improving our processes, trying out new materials, new tools, new pieces of equipment. And uh, I had the opportunity to take part in, in several of those activities. And subsequently, at the same time, we were building a facility in Houston that was really focused on new materials, um, welding innovation, and it actually turned into a major innovation hub for us called the Welding and Applied Technology Center and uh, got the opportunity to go out there, do a lot of things on the innovation side of the business. And um, when the opportunity came up for the chief innovation officer role, uh, they asked me to move to Reston and, and do this. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, my mandate is to really build a culture of innovation, really to you know foster this you know you know you know the, the the mindset of continuous improvement, you know never settle for you know what we've what we've got you know our successes are fantastic. How do we build on those? If we if we do have certain things that didn't work out, why didn't they work out? And how can we implement you know maybe certain types of technology or certain things that we can put in place that can allow us to really grow and learn from those opportunities and 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 ensure that we deliver better and faster and cheaper on the next one. Um, but I think the thing that's that that innovation has really taught me is is about the importance of relationships with your customers as you're building um, uh, the trust and and looking for opportunities to not only save costs for our side of the business, but really you know improve our schedule performance, improve our cost performance um, for our customers because in the end of the day, uh, they benefit from that as well as we do. And, and like I said, we're, we're really focused on the on the next job, you know, delivering for this one to get the next one and the next one and the next one and making sure the customer experience is there. And we believe that technology is at the core of that. Do you have, uh, you know, across, across all of your projects and all your people, I mean, it's a huge, huge organization. How do you, as one person, how do you set up the infrastructure to connect with the business in order to, you know, gather all the innovative things that are happening uh, across the organization and understand them and then decide how do you how do you roll those out and deploy those innovations and make them best practices? Like, do you, do you have like a team of people or like a rotating committee or something like 45,000 people? It's such a massive group. You got to have like, you know, 10 people, you know, in every thousand that are going to focus on that. that you're kind of that are your you know, kind of moles within the organization, if you will, that you can interact with. Like, how are you managing that? 
Yeah, so what we've done is we've actually dispersed our innovation group from being a, a corporately central, I guess, organization to more of a dispersed organization within our business units. And I, I believe that that's paid huge dividends over the last couple of years because that's enabled us um, to have an innovation manager in each of the business units that can flange up with the business line management team, the regional management team, uh, take a look and, and, and correspond with the projects, go out to projects, see what's working, what's not working, how do we you know, how do we leverage? So, so like, to me, the key is if you're on a power job and, and you've done something fantastic on the power job, the first key is to do it on the next power job, right? So let's focus there. But then at the same time, as you're doing that, we've got to see, does that apply to the rest of the business? Can we do that in energy? Can we do that in um, mining? Can we do it in the government branch? You know, all of those things play into it. So we've got a really good relationship with our innovation managers. We have a weekly meeting that really helps us um, discuss what's going on. What are the priorities? What are the things that we're looking at so we're not duplicating effort because that was happening a lot also and um you know i think at the end of the day it, it it helps us get the sponsorship that we need for for some of these initiatives because we can't go out and and pilot things or implement things on projects without you know project management and and all of that uh helping us to facilitate that facilitate the discussions facilitate the opportunity and um, I believe that the dispersed group has really enabled our, our ability to not only get the word out about innovation, but also help us implement, which is which is always a challenge in the industry. Yeah. And I guess like celebrating successes, too, and, and highlighting things that people are doing that have created new value. It's probably they're building that sort of like attention and camaraderie to build that culture up. It's uh, yeah, quite a quite a challenge. Um, so when you think about uh, the challenges that Bechtel's facing, maybe the industry is facing, what are the what are the biggest things that you're focusing on right now? Like, you know, in our market locally here, and it's probably the same everywhere, it's just, just finding talent, finding labor, finding skilled trades to meet the demand of the market. Are you seeing the same thing? And, and what other things are you seeing that are that you're facing? Yeah, I think first and foremost, our, our main challenge as an industry is is supply chain. You know, unfortunately, the geopolitical situation in Europe has has caused significant strains on the supply chain that was already strained because of COVID, right? And so we're really working to work, you know, with our customers to help them understand what the risks are um, in terms of of supply of of commodities that that may not have been an issue two or three years ago. And so we've got to uh, understand how we identify the constraints and really work around them to uh, to deliver the projects for our customers. I would say, you know, secondly, the, the labor shortage is a significant issue here in the United States and globally. Um, as uh, as as the trades begin to uh, to become younger, their numbers are starting to 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 to, to get smaller and they're not replenishing um, the the expertise as, as fast as we need to in order to support the the projects and the types of projects that are coming up right I mean if you take a look at the 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 industry you know we're transitioning from you know uh, coal power we're transitioning from those types of projects into renewables we're you know uh, wind power offshore wind um, new new types of nuclear projects all of these things are are going to require heavy sort of electrical, backgrounds and electricians are going to be, you know, in, in, in a significant need, not to mention the, the types of uh, support, you know, welders, pipe fitters, those types of trades that require a lot of training and require a lot of field experience to get, you know, acclimated to what actually needs to be done and really understand um, the, the, the for lack of a better term, the nuts and bolts of, of how to put things together, right? And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to implement technology as a way to combat the learning curve, as a way to attract new talent to the industry. And uh, we think that it's gonna be significantly beneficial in the future to be able to say, hey, as an industry, construction is leading the way in terms of technology. And, um, you know, we're up there with our with our competitors from, from an industrial perspective, like manufacturing, um, but we need to go make that commitment and do that. And, and it's difficult construct with construction, with the, with the margins and, and everything that we deal with to really go take that head on. But we've seen such a huge investment in construction technology over the last three or four years that we're, you know, we're almost getting to the point where, you know, Bechtel doesn't have to help develop all of these things. There's smarter people out there than me and, and us that are developing technologies that we can bring in pretty quickly and implement, implement you know, at, at a rather fast pace that are that are providing, you know, that's providing value, providing ROI and uh, and helping to positively affect our business and the industry. Yeah, I mean, construction is a very different 
it's very different from say automotive you know where toyota controls the manufacturing process as and decides how much of the margin once they sell the product goes back into r d and back in and to uh to making that assembly process better in our realm you know the developers if they're it's a condo or something like that they hold the line share of the profits and the and the builders kind of compete for very small margins and there's not a lot left over to reinvest uh to improve in your world um you know epc these massive projects i think your margins are a little bit higher and potentially there's a little bit more money to, to kind of reinvest uh which i assume that you're doing but um what, what do you think the root cause of i mean construction just has this reputation of kind of being behind these other markets which in my mind could be debated a little bit but What's your perspective on it? Do you think construction uh, as an industry is far behind from a technology standpoint, from an innovation standpoint, um, behind these other um, uh, industries? And if so, what do you think the root cause is and, and what can we do about it? So if you had asked me that question three or four years ago, I, I definitely would have responded that, that I thought the industry was behind. And, and I think that there just wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for, for growth in, in terms of technology. Um, people were pretty much set in their ways. This is how we do work. We've got our in, you know, in-house uh, homegrown technology suite that we use. And you know, it's been there since 2005 and everybody knows how to use it. And the cost to change is high and the cost to train people is high. Um, as, we, as we've moved into this realm of, of, of agile development and, and uh, technology and you know, in, in your iPhone and, and being able to pick up an app and use it right away, uh, I think that people's mindset is starting to change in terms of, of how they adapt to technology, how they adopt technology, how they view technology. I think that, you know, three or four years ago, I think that people were more apt to say that technology was a risk to their job in terms of, hey, you're using this technology to try to take my job away. Now, I think they're getting to the point of we understand that we've got so much to do. We want to be more efficient with what we do. We want to be more efficient and effective with your time. For example, data transfer. Why do we need to spend so much, so many hours inputting data when we want you as a project controls engineer to be analyzing the data? You're, we, we pay you to analyze the data, identify issues, identify risks, you know, and, 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 and work to you know, alleviate those things instead of building graphs or building spreadsheets. We want you to analyze the spreadsheets instead. And I think that that's, that's powerful. And I think that people are starting to see the value, you know, even with, you know, I, I guess, um, sort of small step change type of applications, you know, digitization, those types of things, where it's just making people's lives easier. And, uh, and overall, you know, I think that at the end of the day, technology can really augment people's roles and, 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 and instead of replace and, and where we do replace, we want to upskill the people which, which you know, may may not, may or may not, uh, you know, have have been able to um, adapt to the new job and, and find them something else to do to 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 enhance their skill skill set and 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 you know really improve their career tra trajectory. Yeah. So you you mentioned earlier this uh, the or you alluded to this ecosystem of startups and uh, you know entrepreneurs that are creating new widgets that uh, improve some narrow uh, workflow that exists in the construction market what is your perspective on this ecosystem of all these startups I mean I'm sure you must be getting basically harassed every day by the, all these you know entrepreneurs coming to you saying hey we made this product we'd love to sell it to Bechtel and of course you want to review it it consumes a lot of time um, what's your perspective on that ecosystem and, and also what's your perspective on these big incumbent um, organizations like you know the Autodesks and the the, the Bentleys and uh, and Hexagon these big organizations that pr provide technology into the industry. Um, how do you how do you think that relationships work should work uh, between these big technology organizations and industry should should industry be driving uh, processes or should we rely on, on technology to define processes that we all use? Like I'm curious from your perspective at Bechtel. Yeah, yeah, that that that's a really good question. The, the the process question is a is a phenomenal question. I mean, I you know, I think from Bechtel's perspective, over the last 125 years, it's been Bechtel's processes, their knowledge base, their understanding of the business that's driven their success, right? So it's you know, like I said earlier, people are our biggest asset. I think that now as, as technology starts to become more prevalent and, and different options are out there and, and, and they're more visible, I think, in the industry than they were before, I think people are starting to question um, 
why do I do things a certain way more often than they used to, right? I think it used to a change in process would take an initiative and it would take months of review and, and all of these different things. Now we can, we can go and, and, and test a new technology pretty quickly and, and get out to a project and, 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 and not really be invasive to the project and, and try things, get feedback, give the, the startup for, for, you know, for, for instance, feedback on their product, which allows them to get better at the same time that we're getting better. And, and really that's part of my job is just opening people's minds to be able to say, why, right? Like why at the end of the day, did I, do I have to do it this way? And if I have to do it on this job this way, is there an avenue for me not to have to do it and do it a better way on the next job, right? So I think that that's, that's really, you know, something that, that, that we take a lot of pride in is our openness to say, if you have a better idea, let's go try it. Um, and if it doesn't work, that's fine. And, you know, I think that, that everybody wants their, their, their idea to work, but if it doesn't work, that's okay too, because we're going to learn from that as well. We don't have to try that again down the line um, and we can build off of that. But uh, I think that's something that, that, that the industry has shifted significantly over the, the last couple of years. From a startup perspective, you know, I think that, that the ideas are, are fantastic. I mean, I think that that is, is the biggest, I would say, success of the startup uh, ecosystem is just their ability to hone in on something, go develop a solution that's going to provide value to companies like ours, and then and then work to figure out what's the best way to get it implemented on, you know, with a smaller company or a company like ours, right? So I think that some of the challenge with us is that, you know, with all of the different startups that come to us, it's just really difficult to be able to say, I'm going to sign an agreement with you and, and, and 50 other ones, because then you get 50 applications, just like on your cell phone, right? You don't want to have 70 apps on your phone to have to do one, you know, multiple things throughout your day. You want to try to minimize that as much as you can. And I think that, um, you know, the Bentleys, uh, you know, they've done several acquisitions over the last couple of years. Some of the software that we use, they've, they've, they've acquired. Hexagon has done the same thing, um, as well as obviously Autodesk. I mean, Autodesk is, is one that's, that's, that's doing acquisitions all the time. And I think that that's the, the, the right way to do it because then, you know, the offerings can, especially on the digital side, the offerings can become available within their ecosystems with a lot, you know, companies like us, we already have agreements with them, which enable us to get access to the software a lot quicker. Uh, they get support and integration with the, the other applications within their platforms, and it enables them to capitalize on that and, and be successful and either go work for Autodesk or, or go start another company that, that does something revolutionary again. Yeah, so you're, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me when big companies start to do buy, build analysis on the, on the software that they use. I mean, you're a large organization, you could probably set up a whole team and, and you probably do build out your own technology for your own purposes. But then in certain cases, you're like, you know, we're going to buy this off the shelf because it's the it's best in class and why reinvent the wheel? Are you are you doing those like as you look at driving innovation within the business and evaluating technology? Are you always doing that analysis saying, well, we could just you know send this over to our dev team and develop that capability internally or we're better off to build this partnership with this external entity? Um, but then they start charging like based on percentage of contract value and things like that. So it gets kind of invasive. I mean, that's the small to medium sized enterprises for sure are feeling starting to feel that that pinch where uh, technology companies are charging based on the size of their projects. Um, Bechtel probably doesn't have that problem. But how do, you, how do you guys do that analysis internally where you might build your own tools versus buy something? And then how do you keep those technology costs in check? Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a challenge. Um... So I guess from the internal external development uh, side of the fence, if we see something that is truly unique to the industry and our competitors aren't doing it and, and it's something that we can really capitalize on from a competitive advantage perspective, then odds are that we're going to take the initiative to develop that internally. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to develop less um, and use what's out there on the street because you know it, it it sometimes it just really doesn't provide us with a significant you know advantage compared to the level of effort that it takes to develop an application maintain the application train the workforce on the application maintain uh support for the uh, for the application throughout throughout its life cycle and i think that what we're seeing is that it's becoming more and more difficult to keep ahead of the technology curve right i think that everybody understands that once you've got something 
that's implemented, there's already five or six things that are better than it um, yeah. as you go. So that's another challenge from our perspective is once we build something, how do we make sure that we're investing in it the way that a software company would invest in it to keep up with the times? And then, you know, we don't have this um, dinosaur of a software program that's integrated to everything and is, you know, and, and we can't get out of it, right? So we've got to be cognizant of that as well. I think that, you know, the API conversation has really helped with that. Uh, enabling us to kind of move software applications in and out, you know, more uh, seamlessly and, and, and enabling us to try new things with, without a significant risk of that happening. But that's really kind of how we approach it. Um, I, I, I really think that, you know, as, as technology continues to be more every day in the industry, the competitive advantage that you gain from it is going to continue to be less and less just because everything's moving so fast. Yeah. So it really becomes your ability to sort of identify products in the market, yeah. understand what gives you a strategic uh, advantage, let all the entrepreneurs and all the startups innovate. I mean, there's like a, you know, a million laboratories out there that you can kind of pick and choose from and incorporate into your technology stack. I think that's a really wise strategy. And then when there's nothing available in the market and you have a really narrow specific problem where it's going to give you a strategic advantage, then deploy your resources internally to build out that, that system. That's uh, right. but, but keep an open mind to, to pick something else that's off the shelf later, I guess. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's maybe a good segue to talk about your internal, uh, I think you called it an innovation fund. I think you've got like $60 million over three years uh, to invest in internal innovation. Is that right? I'll let you describe it because I'll, I'll probably uh, get it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, that's no problem. Uh, the the innovation fund actually was started in 2017 and it ended in 2019. So that was kind of the spark of of innovate, or I guess the restart or reignition of innovation within Bechtel. Uh, 2020 was a, a tough year for all of us uh, with COVID and and you know a lot of projects were canceled, a lot of things were delayed, and so we had to restructure our innovation program. I kind of alluded to that uh, earlier in terms of decentralizing the group into the businesses. We also had to figure out a more sustainable funding model for for the for the business as well, and so we've really turned our innovation fund into more of an R and D cyclical fund where we uh, identify we work with the businesses to identify solutions or identify initiatives that they think are a business priority either for execution or within uh, their customer base that allows us to focus on. Um, smaller numbers of, of initiatives throughout a year cycle. And then, you know, at the end of the year, we'll either re-up those initiatives if they need to be re-upped or we um, start new initiatives that have been approved through our ideation program throughout the year. So our goal is to start the ideation process early in the year, uh, kind of right around now, and really take a look at what are the things that the businesses are prioritizing. Go, go, go try to source new ideas from, from the projects look for ways that we can capitalize on the funding that we've been assigned and, and, and really uh, work with the businesses to ensure we've got sponsorship uh, engagement from senior management and the ability to uh, quickly pilot and, and then scale. So it sounds like your, your R and D spend is very uh, like practical, um, like very practical R and D where you're kind of looking at the way you're currently operating and, and uh, identifying improvements and investing strategically and building up capability do you ever set like moonshots where you're like, okay, we want to the next you know mining project we do, we want to do it 100% with robots, you know, and things like that. Do you set those kind of moonshot uh, things and, and try to drive innovation that way? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've got we've got themed, I guess, initiatives through throughout the year, and 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 those are the type types of things that we want to help shape the ideas that we're getting. So, you know, I think that you know you mentioned construction robotics. That is one sustainability is one where where we want to be leaders on the innovation from from the innovation perspective and taking a look at new solutions and and really trying to accelerate our net zero commitments and 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 really try to figure out ways that we can push the push the the company which then pushes the industry to get better in those respects and and I think that it's uh, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to figure out. Um, you know, what are the things that are most impactful? If, if, if it's a robotic solution, does it provide the ROI, you know, quickly? And, and you know, does does 100% robotics make sense? I'm, I'm not sure. But I think that as we continue to move down the path of uh, trying to enable um, 
more opportunities for people within the industry. I think that it's 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 a must and it's going to attract new talent and it's going to enable us to improve safety and quality of the of the projects that we deliver. So maybe just want, like one last question before we wrap up. When you think about uh, the construction industry at large and you kind of look out into the future of maybe like five, 10 years, what do you think we're going to be doing the same and what do you think we'll be doing that's like drastically different? Oh, so five, so five years isn't that long, right? So I think, um, I, I really think that construction robotics is going to may, may make a major play and a major change in the way that we uh, approach projects. In order to be able to deliver projects with robotics, we've got to start to design the projects with robotic installation in mind. And I think a lot of owners are starting to take a look at how do we operate with, with, with robotic and autonomous equipment and that's going to enable us to start thinking, okay, if we're going to operate with, with robotics and, and operate with autonomous equipment, we need to be able to build with those types of applications. And, and I think that that's something that's going to continue to, to, to move through the industry. And, and I think that we're, we're gonna start seeing it being utilized more and more on our projects. Um, I really do believe that it's going to help us attract the right talent to, to the industry to, to, to help us alleviate the labor shortage. Um, I think that we'll do things a lot more seamlessly. And I think that AI, machine learning, computer, computer vision are going to become more and more prevalent in terms of helping people move, I guess, roles and responsibilities that are currently on site to off site. You know, you mentioned that we do a lot of work in, in remote locations. And so it's, it's hard. It's hard to get people to go to those locations for the amount of time that we're asking them to. So how do we take a look at our processes and really say, does this absolutely 100% have to be done on the job site? Or can we leverage technology to be able to put you in a situation where you can see and feel and hear what you need to hear in order to, to, to perform that activity or that task from your, from your office or from your desk or uh, from somewhere else? You know, and I think that that's, that's something that we're going to see a significant, I, I, I think, increase of is just overall telework for, from, from roles that used to be on project to, to maybe where they're partially on project, partially off project or completely off project. I think that's something that's that we need to um, focus on. And, and, and I think it's going to be something that's a carryover from COVID, uh, but, but really needs to be enhanced and, and not just maintain our ability to continue to do work, but really enhance our ability to deliver. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that we're gonna see an enormous amount of spending and research and startups emerge in that and like actually putting work in place and assembling work on the job site and enhancing the the worker in the field so they can increase their productivity i think that's the biggest challenge we're facing as a as an industry and i, I think that's where all the r d spending and the and the focus is going to go over the next five years uh keith so uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh how can we learn more about bechtel so a couple ways uh, obviously you can go to our website bechtel.com uh, we also have multiple LinkedIn pages, uh, Bechtel Corporation on, on LinkedIn, and as well as uh, Brendan Bechtel's LinkedIn page. So if you, if you want to know more about what's going on in the company overall, those are the best options. If you want to know what we're doing in the innovation group, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to furthering the discussion. So thank you so much for having me. It was an honor to be here. Uh, obviously, I'm very passionate about construction and construction technology, so I could have spent two or three hours on this. So thank you so much for the time. Well, we'll have you back. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Keith Churchill from Bechtel Construction, Chief Innovation Officer. Thank you for your time, and we'll talk again. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, Building Transformations is a non-for-profit. We're focused on uh, delivering new technologies and innovations to ultimately improve our civilization. Uh, this organization is extremely busy. Uh, we have a number of different programs that we're managing every day, uh, and we would love to have your participation. So please go over to cambim.com or, or buildingtransformations.org uh, to get involved. You can check out everything that we're doing. Uh, of course, tune in for our next, uh, next events. We have a very active uh, and busy schedule for the next 12 months. Uh, I also want to thank all of our supporting partners, and we have many of them uh, that make this possible. We can't do this without you, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, and I just want to encourage everyone, of course, to uh, subscribe, like, follow, share uh, this content. We'd love to have you subscribing on YouTube. So uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. And that way, every time we publish content, you're going to get it. Uh, so thank you very much. Building Transformations is a CanBIM production hosted by me, Thomas Strong, produced by Jerry Latman, visual and graphic effects by Allison Burgess, scripting by Joseph Watson, Post-production supervision by Sergei Greshko, editing by Theodore Bezer, 
and visual effects and editing by Musafar Malik.